because of the budget, I thought, well, it'd be nice to do this film with non-SAG. So I place enormous emphasis on casting. I will spend three or four months casting a film. I will usually see every actor myself uh, and uh, every callback. I just, I love the process. It's a discovery process to learn more about my own material and how to direct scenes and often get these incredible gifts from actors where they do something or they bring an, atta an attack to something I never anticipated. But we spent months looking at non-SAG people. We found the best, we called through them, and we did a reading, and I looked at the reading of the screenplay, and I said, what, what am I doing with myself? Uh, where's the nearest oven, you know? And, uh, and so then we, we decided, I, you know, I called the casting director I had worked with, and, and within three weeks we were able to see SAG people, and she brought in some very good people. And no, I did not have Lauren Ambrose in mind. Uh, Lauren just tumbled in, gave a reading that was just really terrific. Actually, the first person to really give a reading, and it's the first time ever that I've offered a part to someone without a second or third reading, was uh, Jennifer Dundas Lowe. It was perfect. It was the absolute perfect reading, one which she could never duplicate again. <laughs> but I said, okay, look, you want it? The part is yours. And she's a wonderful actress. Um, Lauren was a more difficult choice, uh, uh, only because there was so much weight on on, on Lauren's uh, uh, young back, if you will. She, she has to carry the film. She plays a character who's essentially passive for a good part of the film. That's a really, really difficult thing to do. And I think she did a wonderful job. I hate this place. So leave. <laughs> Just like that. Well, I know you have the restaurant. No, I don't care about the restaurant. It's Neil's problem. I just need a car. The way I think the performances became as good as they are in this, however, whatever level they achieved, was uh, first by working the material. Working it, working it, working it to get it as honest and as good as it could be so that the actors could grab hold of it and play it. For instance, one scene uh, that takes place in the bar where Brad is very drunk and Jen, uh, Jenny is trying to comfort him. And we had to get that scene. It was 24 setups, and we had to be out of there because we could not come back to that location. So we had the rest of the night, and when morning came, the shoot was over. And we started the shoot, and Jenny said, look, I, there's something wrong here with this scene. And uh, although we had rehearsed it and tried it, it didn't become apparent until we were on set. And there was a problem with the writing. So we had to rewrite the scene, and then I, of course, had to figure out a way to drop something like 12 or 14 setups in the shoot. But it's keeping the material so an actor can actually play it, keeping it in character, keeping it honest. That's in the writing. The second part of the process is what I would call the pre-production rehearsal, which I like to do, and that is working the material with the actor finding sort of, the, letting them ground themselves in the material, finding out what doesn't work, finding out if an actor can't say a line and they try it 15 times in a row, there's probably something wrong with that line if they're good actors. So you're always, you know, you always sort of want to be protected of the material, but you also want to acknowledge if an actor has a problem. And some of that, that's the kind of thing you work out, what I would call work out in pre-production rehearsal. I don't like rehearsing uh, once I get down there. I uh, oftentimes uh, will shoot a scene cold because sometimes you have first time act first shot actors first take actors and sometimes you have 50th take actors and of course when they're in two shot together you're totally screwed the way i like to work though is i generally like to let the actors move through the scene and make their choices and then adjust the blocking to that there was one scene for instance in the uh piercing shop where it required frankie to get up and leave the shop at the end of the scene we shot the whole scene we were pressing it was the first week uh, we were just behind schedule. It was like five in the morning. Everybody was exhausted. We could not get the scene to work. And I had to come back and reshoot the whole thing. After discussing it with uh, Ciro Silva, who was one of my students also, who was the associate producer, it became clear that the act, the blocking of having Frankie have to get up and leave the chair, went back all the way to the beginning of the scene. It was a choice that she couldn't make naturally out of the scene. And trying to work her performance to get there was throwing the whole scene off. So by changing that action at the back, we reshot the scene and it played much, much better. You know, my position on directing is you, you say as little as you possibly can, speak only when it's absolutely necessary, especially when you have really good actors. And two, uh, for me, my role is to sort of be the arbiter of whether or not 
they're getting the moments. And for that, I mean, the, I think the hardest thing for a director is to be in the moment with the actors, experiencing the take with all this insanity going on around you. And uh, that's what I was able to do. My, my responsibility to them was to make sure that they look good. Tell me, look at fuck himself. This place is yours too. This place is yours? It's my family. It's half yours so I can half do what I want. So you better not fuck around because you'll fire your ass. Why were you in Arizona? Oh, because my parents moved there when they retired. <laughs> Holy shit, was it hot in Arizona. You know how they say there's no humidity there? My ass, I nearly sweated my tits off. Frankie's dad was like, don't leave the house without your water bottles. No one in Arizona leaves their house without their water bottles. A couple of kids went out in the desert with a six pack of Pepsi and never came back. Because you did, didn't you? That's because she never left the house without her water bottle. You know, there'd be times when I, I, I didn't know how to get them to go where they needed to go, but I knew they hadn't arrived. So we would try it again and again until, you know, we would try different things. And if the actor wasn't happy, I generally you know, went again. Uh, sometimes, though, the sort of the politics of, uh, of power uh, uh, would force a complete reversal of that. There was one big emotional scene for uh, Lauren, which she couldn't get to. And it, you know, had to do with her own personality. And uh, it's what she's called the ugly. You're so ugly, the lifeguard says to her, you know. And she just couldn't get to be where she needed, you know. And... Um, uh, I wouldn't, you know, after three takes, I said, that's it. Because we were having sort of a thing about who was in charge of the set that day. And so even though I knew I didn't have it and I had to come back, write a new tale to the scene. And it was necessary to do that, to let Lauren understand that as good as she was, that I was still the director of the film and I would be making the decisions and not her. And uh, so sometimes, you know, directing is not only just about finding it, but it's trying to deal with the personalities and accommodate them uh, in a, in a way that is productive, hopefully.